This program is made possible in part by a grant from Charlotte Metcalf. After Alfred Noble developed dynamite, his invention reshaped the world, literally. From mining to infrastructure projects, dynamite proved essential to building the modern world. But it also changed political violence, both on battlefields and in the streets, where the first wave of modern terrorists adopted the explosive as a weapon of choice. Today's guest says we have work to do to manage the new age of open technological innovation before it gets ahead of us with potentially destructive consequences. She's Audrey Kurth Cronin this week on Story in the Public Square. Welcome to a Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Each week, we talk about big issues with great guests, authors, journalists, scholars, and more to make sense of the stories that shape public life in the United States today. To help us this week, we're joined by Audrey Kurth Cronin, one of the world's true experts on terrorism and security. Currently at American University, where she is Professor of International Security and Founding Director of the Center for Security, Innovation, and New Technology, Dr. Cronin is also the author of a new book, Power to the People, How Open Technological Innovation is Arming Tomorrow's Terrorists. Audrey, thank you so much for being with us. It's a pleasure to be here, Jim. So, open technological innovation, what is that? Well, technological innovation in the 20th century was mostly closed, meaning that most people who engaged in building potentially lethal technologies had to have security clearances and were doing things that were very much within the military realm. Um, not exclusively, but mostly. So closed technological innovation means that your ordinary person on the street isn't going to be able to create a nuclear weapon or a, a large ship that's important to the military. So the Manhattan Project, that was exactly. closed a closed technological innovation. Exactly. Open technological innovation is where many people have access to the tools that are necessary to build new things. And that's what we had at the end of the 19th century, where you had people like um, Marconi, who built the radio in the attic of his house. Uh, and we have that now in the 21st century, because you have the access to using platforms to be able to really be creative and that's what innovation is all about today. What was it so when we think about it, so your book is sort of this wonderful history of open technological innovation in the late 19th early 20th century uh, and the book we should know is Power to the People. Uh, it, do you when you look back at that period at the end of the 19th and the early 20th century were there societal features were there were there cultural characteristics that are common with the kind of open technological innovation we see today? Yes, exactly. Uh, when Alfred Nobel invented dynamite in the late 19th century, he did it because what he was trying to do was invent a better explosive that could help us build the infrastructure of the, of the world, you know, help us build bridges and, and mine, uh, mines and tunnels. And uh, it was essential. It was a wonderful innovation and a wonderful invention. But, but we also had the evolution of nefarious uses of dynamite. In fact, the beginning of modern terrorism, as we understand it today, was set off by the invention of dynamite. But the other thing that's similar then and today is that you had a huge development of um, inequality in terms of, of income. And you had a tremendous amount of labor unrest. And you had a, a number of people get very, very rich, and others who could access dynamite we're not doing so Let's well. Think of the Gilded Age in America exactly. and, and all that. Yep. Uh, so, but I want to I want to pick up on one thing though. Sort of the the dynamite's relationship to the start of that first modern wave of terrorism. Can you unpack that for us? Yes, absolutely. So, the first modern wave of terrorism is loosely called the anarchist wave, but it actually had n uh, nationalists in it. It had social revolutionaries in it, and um, there were attacks using dynamite and also in ca some cases firearms on every continent in every part of the world except Antarctica. So what time What time period are we looking at? What years specifically? From about 1867 until um, 
off and on until about 1934. In Europe and in most parts of the world, it ended in with the First World War. But in the United States, what's really interesting is that compared to Europe, the attacks went on longer in the United States. So did Marxism, the advent of Marxism and then Marxism-Leninism feed into that in any way? It did. Uh, they benefited from the access to those kinds of means of destruction. Yes, absolutely. But it was more... Um, anarchist and, and nationalist ideas, especially before the, the Soviet Revolution in 1917. What were some of the other technologies from that period that altered security and conflict? I mean, dynamite is clearly, you know, I guess, exhibit number one, but there were others. You mentioned radio. I mean, I, perhaps that had an impact. I'm it guessing did. it did. And so this is one of the things that's really interesting about that period. It was, these are ordinary technologies that were developed. You know, Marconi, uh, just an amateur working in his attic. Um, you also had the, the invention of the airplane. That's another perfect example oh, right, of sure. where you had bicycle manufacturers who, you know, they were very talented. I'm not trying to say that they were just your ordinary person off the street. They had some training. The Wright brothers. Obviously. The Wright brothers, exactly. Yeah. And in Dayton, Ohio, they were working in a shed in their backyard. Yeah. So both of those technologies became extremely important to the First World War and the Second World War. So one of the key points is it's not a hermetic seal in an open technological revolution between technologies that are developed for you know, normal purposes and those that end up being important in war. Is there something inherently... So you think about sort of the nuclear revolution, and there's a, there's a lot of literature, a lot of academic debate about whether or not nuclear weapons make the world more stable or less stable. But if we're talking about open technological innovation, is there something inherently unstable? Because there's a, by definition, it's, a, it's accessible to everyone. Yes. This is about the democratization of violence. And the democratization of violence, if you support the cause, might be a good thing. Uh, you know, the democratization of the access to the means of, of communication in the Arab Spring you know, there was a, a movement towards greater freedom and, and new ideas. And I'm not trying to argue that this is all bad, our current open technological period. Not by any means. But it's normal that the when you have positive uses of technology, you also have the negative ones. So what I was trying to do in my research was explain how does that process work and what kinds of technologies actually spread. And can we understand what those technologies are with respect to today so we can reduce those risks? So isn't that true of many technologies? I mean, going back to that early period, I often think of the automobile, the advent of the automobile. It was greeted with, with great enthusiasm by some people, and it was objected to by many other people. Yes. So it was a great way to move around. It was fast. It was better than the horse. But on the other hand, you began to have traffic. You began to have pedestrian accidents. You began to have accidents. Again, a, sort of a two-edged sword. Is, is that true of most, if not all, technologies? Well, open technologies. Open technologies, yes. There's a two-edged sword. But the key thing is to try to figure out how you can reduce that negative edge and, and maintain the positive elements. So, for example, driverless cars today. Driverless cars are an extremely important area that many of the major technological companies, Google, and uh, they're all heavily, uh, Microsoft, heavily invested in. And the automakers themselves. And the automakers. And, and this could be a wonderful thing, and I think it will be as, as we get older. You know, we're going <laughs> to we're gonna need to be able to have um, cars that correct for our deficiencies. And I like and, the idea you can just get in a nap when you go somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> right? So do I. I. Book, or, right? Exactly. Yeah. So that's the good side and and it's not about reducing the good side it's about trying to make sure that they're not also used as you know suicide bombers without the suicide exactly yeah precisely wow I hadn't thought of that that so, that's scary so you know a lot of the technology that we're talking about now in the, in the current context is technology that as you point out emerged from government labs and government re public publicly funded research projects uh, in the second half in the second the last quarter really of the 20th century when does that innovation that, bego that begins in government labs get open to the world and why? Yes. So actually, we think that things are moving really fast today, but it's not the case. We have the maturing of a process that started in the 1990s. So after the Cold War ended, um, there was a belief in the United States that, you know, we, we had basically won. The end of history. <laughs> exactly. All that triumphalism. Yeah. The yeah. new world order. Right. And so very consciously we began to release technologies that had been developed specifically for military purposes or um, in government, uh, de you know, development under grants or in, in government laboratories. For example? Well, for example, ARPANET became the Internet. That, that happened a little bit earlier. 
um, you had the spread of uh, uh, you know other other technologies that had been built in the United States, like the the, the touch screen for the smartphone. Siri is developed. Voice activation systems are all government programs. These programs were deliberately spread and they're one of the reasons why you have the tremendous wealth in many of the private companies because those technologies were originally government but now they're open to all of us. Talk about drones. My understanding is drones were developed in, in the private sector as opposed to the government sector but obviously now some governments use drones tremendously. Just talk about the impact of drones which I find drones personally fascinating although hard to <laughs> At least the one I have, so maybe I need a new model. Well, when we talk about drones, we have a wide range of things that we're talking about. So if you're talking about drones like UAVs that are military systems, those go back to the Vietnam War and even earlier. Those go back really? to, yes, to um, the V-1 buzz bombers. They go back yeah. many centuries. So there's a huge, long history of unmanned aerial vehicles, okay. remote vehicles. So there is a government element to the development of drones. But if you're talking specifically about quadcopters, the little hobbyist copters that we have, those did come out of the private sector, but only with, again, the use of many of these um, government-sponsored uh, original technologies. So the ability to use digital means comes from government technological development. Some of those, some of those drones you're talking about, the non-government drones today, are, are very sophisticated. And, and, e and easy to navigate, despite what I just said. You don't have to spend a whole lot of money to get a drone that you can fly great distances and carry something, for example, exactly. a camera or a weapon. And we've exactly. seen terrorist organizations begin to innovate with delivering payloads by drone, haven't we? Yes, we have. ISIS did. Yeah. And, you know, it's never going to be that they're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with militaries, but what you get is the ability to disrupt. And also remember that when you're engaged in a conflict, one of the things that you want to do is maintain political support. And so it may not be that you know an insurgency or a terrorist group or a private army has to be just like the army that it's against. I mean, it just has to prove that it can be in the fight. And so when ISIS was using drones, they were actually causing a lot of civilian casualties within Iraq. I mean, you used to have um, eight or nine people who would show up at least every day, and sometimes many more, um, who would show up in emergency rooms every day. And there's, there's another factor, too, which is the fear factor, for lack of a better word. Yes. The thought that this thing might be coming, you might not see it, or just, boom, it shows up in your backyard, bang. Exactly. And so, so it's a psychological element to it. And that's a key thing in the democratization of violence because if you can prove, if you can keep people on edge, I mean, look what happened immediately after September 11th that had an enormous impact upon our country. Yeah. What I'm worried about is not that these technologies and their nefarious uses are going to be overwhelming for military forces, but that they're going to they're going to kind of change the the dynamic with um, with with how publics support their governments and how we respond to the, that threat of violence. Yes, yeah. exactly. I mean, that's already happened, hasn't it? I think it has. Yeah. yeah, it's it's in the process of happening. I mean, you see mass shootings that are also a part of this dynamic. I mean, this kind of violence is already appearing. Well, so you mentioned mass shootings. One of the other case studies that you have in your book is about the the the, the spread of the AK-47. And the link between that and again a, a, a second wave of modern terrorism. Can you explain that for the audience? Yes. So the AK-47, obviously invented by Mikhail Kalashnikov in 1947, was extremely important in uh, an increase in the success for insurgencies that we saw after World War II. This statistic sort of boggled my mind when, when I heard it. it. Was so prior to prior to the invention of the AK-47, about 25 percent of insurgencies succeed. And after the AK-47? It's at least 40%. Different um, authors have different amounts. Some of them are even higher. So 40% is conservative. So, so what does the AK-47 do that weapons of that type, rifles, did not do before the AK-47 for people in our audience who have heard AK-47 but don't know exactly maybe what it is? Okay, well the AK-47 is um, an assault rifle and it's uh, very light, very easy to use. Um, kids can be trained to use it in 10 minutes. I mean, it's horrifying to, to talk about it and to think about it. Uh, it's very um, durable. It's, it's not a, a, a kind of an accurate weapon and so it replaced rifles that were far more powerful, far more accurate, far more impressive. But the Soviet Union built it for a peasant army, a conscript army. It's extremely easy to understand, extremely to put together and take apart easy, easily. And, and you can 
um, sort of switch parts from gun to gun. It's just a rattle trap kind of, especially the original AK-47. It's, it's not a, a, a sophisticated weapon, but because anyone can use it, and the Soviet Union began to supply AK-47s to many insurgencies that supported uh, you know, Marxism throughout the 20th century, we have 70 to 100,000 AK-47s, four or five times as wow. many as any other weapon <clears throat> that are floating around in the world. And they're durable, too. They last. Yes. They're so, well built and they last. And there are all kinds of stories <clears throat> about AK-47s being found in the sand and, you know, people will, will so, use what, them still. So is, and so is it just the, is it, their, is it their availability and their ease of use that makes them so important to terrorist organizations from the middle of the 20th century on? And, and not just terrorist organizations, but also individuals and small groups. Yes, but they're cheap, they're accessible, easy to use. Um, they have a tremendous amount of, of effect, impact, um, and you know anyone can can be trained to use it in in a few hours. So. One of the things we like about your work, your scholarship, is you don't go full blown into dystopia. No. Which you could have. If I were writing this book, that's where, <laughs> because I do write dystopian fiction, that's maybe where I would have gone. But you don't do that much to your credit. Was, was that a conscious decision that you didn't create this fear, horrible thing, dystopia? Absolutely. The future is. That was exactly what I, I, it actually pleases me tremendously, Wayne, that you feel that way. <laughs> because this is my worry. I'm not. A lot of people are giving a lot of attention to how other states are using new technologies. I mean, you know, the, the headliner is the AI, artificial intelligence race between yeah. the United States and China. And, and I'm, that is also very important, state use of technology. But what I found was there was a gap in how people were understanding the democratization of technologies and their spread. But I didn't want that gap to be filled with all kinds of hysterical arguments about how terrible the world is and how dystopian it is. But at the same time, I don't want people to be overly complacent. And, and so the purpose of the book is to show that we have history. We have lessons that we've learned in which kinds of technologies develop in certain ways, which kinds of technologies spread easily and democratize violence. So we should just look at that history and use it in order to find that middle road, that via media, and the, you know, between uh, being overly hyped, there are a lot of people who do that, and those who, who are too complacent. So, you know, you, you, it's, a, it's a sophisticated argument and, and, and a persuasive one. My question is about the policymaking environment yes. that, 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 that this is entering into, where we don't seem as a society right now to be sort of grappling with sort of long-term issues and long-term challenges that, that are our public square is filled with a lot of other noise, uh, and we're not going to have a serious conversation on this. But even set, even as outside of the public square, in Congress, in the places in government that you would expect to be worried about the things that need to be worried about, are these conversations taking place? They're beginning. I, I do live in Washington, D.C., and so I spend a lot of time talking to people there, and also there's more expertise being developed, um, especially among organizations like the Congressional Research Service, trying to help congressmen understand, and, and they're, they're, they're really working hard and doing well. But we have a long way to go. And I think that the public square is important to getting us there, because the other yeah. side of this is the major companies, Microsoft, you know, Google, Facebook, Twitter. They're beginning to understand the downsides of their own technologies, and they're, some of them are actually either openly or, or privately begging for greater reg regulation and greater guidance because really? they realize that the, it's has a, having an impact on their own business model. When, when you have a disaster that is partly spread and, and sort of publicized over Instagram, for example, or, Facebook or WhatsApp, Live or Facebook Live, exactly, or this not hurts e them. Not, not even a, a, a natural disaster, but you know, uh, first person active shooters who have right. yeah. strapped out a GoPro cam and broadcast their and we've atrocities. Seen, we've seen cases of yeah. that. Yeah, in, in the Christchurch murders um, yes. in March of this year. Yes, absolutely. So that's one of the things that's driving the violence. So the connection between the technology and the changes in communication is extremely important. And that's another thing that's similar with the late 19th century. Because you had this huge explosion of, of newspaper global circulation, and you had the era of yellow journalism and sensationalism, and the huge building of the Pulitzer and the Hearst uh, empires. Yeah. And it's very similar to what we have now with the building of the ability to use digital means in order to spread unedited 
information. So you talk, you sort of have a, a, a universe of uh, three broad themes, three broad challenges that we face in terms of the, 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 the current era of open technological innovation. And you, you mentioned sort of the communication challenge, but one of the one of the things that you put your finger on is the issue of mobilization. And so how is this emerging technology being used to mobilize, I guess, bad actors, for lack of a better term? Yeah, well, it, it's that's the earliest and the most evident of the three trends. Um, mobilization, we saw that in ISIS. I mean, that's the easiest example. We saw their ability to recruit people and to build an image of themselves and to actually use you know, GoPro cameras and other media uh, effects in order to spread their violence and, and their message very directly to individuals. Because the other side of it is that we now have the ability to collect information on people too. So you can recruit, you can groom people, and ISIS and also Al Qaeda has begun, had been doing that as well. And this is globally done too. Yes. This is people in America and people in the Middle East and wherever. We, yes. We've, seen, we've spent a lot of time on this show and sort of I think as a nation talking about what happened in 2016 to the use of psychographic targeting for political voting mobilization. Is that happening in terrorist organizations too? Are, 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 are terrorist organizations as sophisticated as the Internet Research Agency was in terms of targeting people based on their likes and their social media profiles? They're developing some capability. They're never going to be as good as a state-sponsored uh, and state-involved organization. So they're never going to be equal. But yes, I mean, the fact that ISIS was able to build that kind of support and then take over an enormous part of Iraq and Syria, I mean, it, it's very clear that they have that effect already. So what about, what about some of the technologies that are emerging now that we may not know about, that perhaps you know about, that have application to this and, and I'm thinking of facial recognition that's not exactly what you're, you're talking about here but that's emerging people are beginning to question that what else might be going on that you'd like to or that you know about well what I'm most concerned about is the clusters of technology that m many of the technologies have already appeared so facial recognition technology is a great example if you have the ability to recognize someone according to their face you can also recognize them in order to target them. And we're living in an era just like the 19th century where assassination is one of the most common uh, tools that, that's used. I mean, drone strikes, uh, they're, you know, they're, they're state-sponsored, so we won't call them assassinations, but uh, let's say individual targeting. Mm -hmm. We now have a, a suite of technologies that you can use to identify people by their face, facial structures, to understand their movements. I mean, everything that you do with your s smartphone that you carry around with you tells people where you are, to understand, you know, what their, their, their political and sort of social backgrounds are. There's an enormous amount of information you can find online. It, it, it's, it's the integration of those technologies that is most dangerous. And it's not so much the technologies that we haven't seen, it's the human uses of those technologies that I'm most worried about. Well, you know, some facial recognition at its most sophisticated level can pick individual faces out of a crowd of thousands. You know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of what's happening in Hong Kong now, one of the reasons exactly. why they're wearing masks. Masks and umbrellas, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but that's kind of a frightening tool. It is, and it's being used very, um, very vigorously by the Chinese government. Uh, but there's another side to facial recognition technology, and that is that it's only as good as the machine learning and the databases, the big databases that, that people have that they use in order to identify faces. And those databases are not equally representing every part of our society. So I'm very concerned not just about um, the fact that you're going to have the potential to kill more people, but also that there could be the potential for tremendous new rifts in our society and, and um, between rich and poor, just like in the 19th century, mm. but also between dif different ethnic groups. Because facial recognition technology has a much harder time identifying people with darker skin, for example. Right. It's a really serious problem. So we mentioned at the start that you are the founding director of the Center for Security, Innovation, and New Technology at American University. Tell us about the center. Well, the center has um, a number of other people who are involved in it, and we have, we're covering not just questions related to terrorism and the things that I've just talked about, but also questions about the future of the workforce and um, you know, how to adapt to the use of, a greater use of robotics. What will this mean for our students? How can we better train them so that they're ready to be adaptable and agile? Uh, we have people who are working on cyber. We have people who are working on every aspect of these new technologies that I've been describing. Is there, do, you, do you come away from all this 
optimistic, pessimistic. What's I, mean, I know you, and that you're, you're you're a generally upbeat, positive, even keeled person. But the sort of you know, I think that the the risk for some folks is that they're going to read this, they're going to listen to this argument, and they're going to feel overwhelmed yeah. by the enormity of the challenge. Where do you come down on this? Well, that kind of gets back to what Wayne was saying. I don't believe in being overly hyped when it comes to the use of new technologies or overly dystopian. And what I see among our public square is that people are going in one direction or the other. And if, if we don't, if we give up that middle space, we're not going to be able to build the kind of optimistic future that I think we can build. So the main reason I'm, I'm working on this is because I am optimistic and I want us to make these changes in advance before we have a major incident rather than be forced to make them afterwards. So how else do we get to that middle area in the, in the public square? I mean, obviously, your scholarship and, and your work helps in that regard. How else? Let me just piggyback on that, too. Is, the, is there a regulatory model that, that uh, fits in this space? I think there are a number of models, and it depends on each country. This is something that comes out um, also in the 19th century, but uh, some models uh, involve self-regulation. And uh, many of the companies, as I mentioned before, realize that their business model is under threat and they're beginning to understand and, and be interested in self-regulation. The president of Microsoft just came out with a new book about, uh, it's called Weapons and, and Tools. And he's talking about, you know, how can we maintain the advantages? Um, so, so some of it is self-regulation, some of it is putting in place um, national regulation, and, and also uh, trying to make sure that people are well informed. We have to develop a more resilient um, community. And so that's another reason why I wrote. That's remarkable. Look, we've got literally about 20 seconds left, and there's no way you can answer this question, but a lot... <laughs> of, we love doing this, right? A lot of your previous scholarship was focused on the threat posed by terrorism. Uh, we have a, a debate right now about American policy in the Middle East, about American policy in Syria. The fundamental question, you wrote a book about how terrorist movements end. Yeah. Is ISIS dead? Oh, it's not dead. It has morphed into a, a movement that is uh, more global. But I think it's a lot weaker than it was. And it could be dead if we have good, intelligent policy coming from the top. Great place to leave it. Audrey, thank you so much for being with us. She's Audrey Kurth Cronin. The book is Power to the People. It's worth the read. That's all the time we have this week. But if you want to know more about storing the public square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org. We can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square. This program is made possible in part by a grant from Charlotte Metcalf.